Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Cheatash. My name is Chris, and today we're going to be going over Chapter 2, Part 3 of our journey through 1984. Just continuing along this journey, it's basically been the Winston and Julia show for the entirety of Chapter 2. And it all stems from Winston seeing her in the middle of the street uh, when he exits the junk shop back in Prolandia, the, the place where it's mainly inhabited by proles. And he wants to kill her. Remember, he wants to kill her. Now all of a sudden she tells him she likes him. Now they're hanging out. They just uh, they just were very intimate with each other. They met out in the countryside. Entirety of chapter two has reminded me of Anakin Skywalker and um, Padme on episode two of Star Wars, <laughs> where people hated that movie because it was just this Naboo uh, love fest. And that really seems like what's going on here in 1984. Um, I... I you know, it's not a full 100% comparison, but it just kind of reminds me of that. We've seen just a lot of Julian Winston. And in part three here, it's going to continue. Um, part three continues right where we left off in part two, where they are coming to. It's I don't think it's quite the next day, but they're they're waking up. You know, they, they just had sex. They did their political act is what they call it. Remember, they're in the countryside. They took two different paths to get here. And Winston was very apprehensive at first, but then they end up really embracing and having like a true like physical connection. So they fall asleep. They come to and Julia is acting very different now. Winston describes her as very businesslike. She basically starts explaining to him like the next set of instructions. Like, okay, the this place that we're currently at now, we can come here once again, but then never again after that. Uh, we can go home, but we're going to go separately. You're going to wait 30 minutes after I leave. And we're not going to go home the same way we, that we came here. She's She's very businesslike. It's and she says it before, she's done this kind of thing before with other party members. And she knows about this place and the grassy knoll and the on the countrysides outside of London. So she's been out here before. She's very experienced at this. So she just gets down to the point, hey, here's what we got to do. Follow my instructions. Let's not get caught. And they set up another meeting. They're, they're going to end up meeting again but only in crowded areas similar to where they met when they met in uh what was that part 1 in Victory Square where they basically had to talk to each other they couldn't look at each other they had to talk to each other only when the crowd like enveloped them they were in the middle of the crowd just to keep away from the telescreens but anyway she ends up leaving he's you know, sitting there waiting for his turn to go. Um, I find it interesting. He still doesn't know her last name. She knows his last name, Winston Smith. Um, he doesn't know her address. He doesn't know her last name. He's really, at this point, too, he doesn't really know for sure where she works. Like, he, he's pretty sure she works in the fiction department, but she doesn't. he doesn't really know what there. So they are going to end up meeting again. They end up making love on another occasion at a ruined church that, and here's an interesting detail, the church was bombed. Lots of al alluding to bombings that George Orwell puts in here. We He's stated before how, you know, London looks like it's basically been bombed to oblivion. It does not look good, minus the ministries of truth, love, plenty, etc., we saw Winston when he was visiting the proles. Witnesses firsthand, up close and personal, a bomb that detonates, that gets dropped not too far from him. The church here was bombed. It, lots of interesting things about bombings and war. It makes you think, what happened during the revolution? Because that's really what Winston is referencing here. The church was bombed, 
during the revolution. A rocket bomb must have dropped quite near at hand. And I think he mentions that it, it was bombed during the revolution. I'm pretty sure. Let me see if I can find that really quick. Maybe not. She had memories. Maybe not. But they, they end up meeting. Like I said, they, they'll meet in the streets. Intermittent conversations. They're never looking at each other face to face. They have to talk by installment. So they have like a little bit of a hushed conversation. Then they get separated. Then they pick back up once they're a little bit closer. Then they stop again because they're near a telescreen or there's not enough people around to drown out the noise of their conversation. Um, there's a confusing part on page 131. This was really weird. Oh, and I'm sorry. Yes. Church almost deserted stretch of country where an atomic bomb had fallen 30 years earlier. So 30 years earlier from 1984, I think that was like revolutionary times. So this was like, well, maybe not because Winston is, well, no, Winston's 39 years old. So 30 years ago. So that was kind of when he was a kid. So that might have been revolutionary times when this bomb dropped on the church that they made love in, the Belfry Church. Um, but there's a confusing part on page 131. Let me know what you guys think here. A bomb drops... And then it reads, even her lips were white, she was dead. He clasped her against him and found that he was kissing a live, warm face. So, like, a bomb drops near them, but then it's like, she died, but, like, she didn't die. It was a really weird part. Like, I don't know if he's, like, imagining this, but they're hanging out, all of a sudden a bomb drops, and she's dead. But she's not dead, because later on... The, He's going to keep talking about her as if she's still alive. Really weird. Really, really weird. I don't know what Orwell was trying to do there on page 131. <laughs> but we continue. Uh, Julia mentions that she has to c camouflage herself. So they're both talking about meeting up again, but they're both working these long hours in preparation for hate week that will be coming up. And Winston finds it intriguing, like, how much Julia goes along with the party, but also curses like a sailor, does not act like a party member, like when they were out in the middle of the countryside. Far from it. She's cursing. She doesn't speak in new speak at all. He notices that. And Julia basically says that she has to spend a lot of time doing these party activities because it's a form of camouflage. And she mentions when you keep the small rules, you can break the big ones, like going off to the countryside. But that freedom, and it's not really a freedom because she's breaking the law. Like if she were found out, she'd probably be killed. But she's able to do that based on the fact that she goes to so many of these meetings. She leads the anti-sex league. She goes on community hikes. She does demonstrations. She prepares banners for hate week. She does all the things of a zealous party member so that the scent is kind of thrown off her trail. So people of the inner party, people higher, closer to Big Brother, aren't questioning her. So it's a form of camouflage, she states, that she's doing all these things. And we find out a little bit more about Julia. Again, we still don't really know her last name. But Winston starts to describe a little more information on her that she's 26 years old. So she's significantly younger than him. She lives in a commune with 30 other girls. Lots of girls. She says she hates living with women, actually. She does not like living with that many women. Uh, she does work in the fiction department. She works on the novel writing machines in the fiction department. And she services the motor of this machine. Powerful but tricky motor. So he kind of had a feeling about this, so his feelings were upheld. Uh, she doesn't read, though. Even for working in the fiction department, she doesn't read much. She says that books were just a commodity that had to be produced, like jam or bootlaces. So it's just another thing that they have to produce for the
the proles or the party members. It's not seen as something like necessary or something that you need to do. No, it's just a product. It's just a piece of propaganda, something for the proles. That's all that's really looked at. She was too young to remember anything pre-revolutionary times. She did have a family member, her grandfather, who probably knew about this. She doesn't really talk about anything pre-revolutionary, although she probably did when her grandfather was alive, but again, he disappeared when she was super young. She was the captain of the hockey team and a gymnast, so you know she's, she's an athlete, I guess you could say. Uh, she was picked to work at Pornosec because of her good work behavior, I guess. And I guess that's a pretty like prestigious thing to work at the Pornosec. And I guess we're found out that Pornosec is mostly women work there because you know men are just more aggressive, testosterone. They're they don't want men of the party getting too into the work they do. So next thing you know, you have a bunch of men working at Pornosec and they're spending more time watching the porn than producing it. You know, something like that. So it's mostly women that work there. Again, Pornosec is produced, these like sexual films, imagery, etc., produced for the proles, not for party members. Party members were like frowned upon or it was like illegal for party members to even look at this kind of stuff, specifically for the proles. Um, we've mentioned before how Julia says that she is very experienced with sex and intimacy, all that stuff. Her first love affair was at 16 with a party member. And the party member actually ends up, I think it was committing suicide. And he was really old too. He was like 60. And he ends up being arrested, uh, committed Oh, who later committed suicide to avoid arrest. Otherwise, they'd have my, had my name out of him when he confessed. And maybe she would have been killed too. Did I skip a slide? All this leads to, you know, Julia's general feelings on the party. It's obvious that Julia hates the party. She mentions so in the in previous, in chapter two, part two. She doesn't like them. She curses them. But Winston goes on to describe that the hate doesn't really manifest itself in anything besides just trying to live her life in a way that she wants to without upsetting the current balance of it. She has no general criticisms of the party. She couldn't tell you why she hates it. Well, she can tell you why she hates it, but... It's only for her benefit. She doesn't believe the brotherhood exists, and she just wants to stay alive. The party is getting away in the way of her fun, whereas Winston knows the criticism. She's critical of the party and the freedoms that he can't have. And generally views the world in a way that, hey, times were different before and they probably were better before the revolution, before Big Brother came along. He's trying to ask questions. Julia's just trying to live life. She's like a free spirit. Breaking rules, staying alive, live fast, die young. Winston's trying to get to get to the bottom of how did this all happen how can I free myself, but how can I free other people? You know, he's interested in Goldstein. He's asking questions. Julia doesn't care about Goldstein. She doesn't even believe the brotherhood exists. She doesn't want to waste her time with it. Hey, I just want to get out here, have fun, fuck the party. It's getting in the way of that, but I'm not here to start a revolution. Whereas I think I think Winston is. That's why he's writing in his diary. That's why he goes down to where the proles are and talks with one of the older guys and is asking him questions. 
right? Next thing you know, Catherine is brought up. This is uh, Winston's, again, Winston's uh, wife. And she mentions how she's super familiar with Catherine's uh, duty to the party quote that she had on basically Catherine wanted to have a kid, but because it was the duty to the party to have a kid for the party. That's why they were having sex like a ton, he said, but she hated it. And and Julia knows this. Julia knows this behavior because, again, she's at the anti-sex league. She's heavily involved in it. She's seen this before. She sees that the sexual instinct is trying to be driven out. And it, it really has been driven out. Because the sexual instinct is out of the party's control if it if it's left to fester. And sexual privation, and privation here means like withholding. There's a better word for it, but withholding, like not negation, but yeah, you're withholding sex, basically. This induces a hysteria, which then gets funneled into war fever or leader worship. And it's essentially sex gone sour. Right, So all that bundled up energy that people put toward the two minutes of hate, towards cheering for when they have, they're going to war with India, towards cheering when a big brother is there to calm and soothe you with his fancy mustache and his words. All that energy could be put towards sex, but the, and the party knows that. So prevent people from having sex, and then use that energy against them to just further push the party's agenda. Because let's say you're in an intimate relationship, you find yourself happy, you're happy with yourself, with your partner, times are good, why support Big Brother at that point? We've mentioned this before in previous episodes. So Big Brother, the party, knows this. So that's where they're trying to makes sex like a disgusting act. It was f- looked on as like you were getting a, what did they mention? Like a couple parts ago was, it, it was not only disgusting, it was viewed as like you were getting like a colonoscopy or like an enema. Like just really like people don't want to do it anymore. The, the impulse, again, it's a really dangerous thing to the party. So, Winston and Julia are hanging out a little bit. Winston tells Julia about a story when they, him and Catherine were on a community hike. They end up getting lost, and Catherine starts to become a little bit uneasy. And it's interesting, knowing what we know about Catherine, she thinks she's doing something wrong being far away from everybody else on the hike. Winston seems calm, cool, and collected. But Catherine says, senses something is wrong being away from the group. She tries to head back and get in contact and reach the group, basically rendezvous with the group again. But Winston points out some flowers on the cliff beneath them. And he says to Catherine, hey, check out these flowers. You might like these flowers. So she comes closer to get a better glimpse of them. And he's holding on to her waist while she's peering over this ledge. And... He notes to Julia, actually, Julia notes to him. Julia brings this up. Why didn't you give her a good shove, she says. I would have. That's what Julia says. Because she. it's almost like she knows what Winston's getting at, just from him telling the story. And he says if he was the same person at the present moment, he says he would have. There's no telescreens. Chances of a microphone out there are low. Nobody's around him. And he probably would have. And here's the end of part three here where Winston ends up getting in like a little bit of an argument discussion with Julia and saying that, hey, if Winston ended up pushing Catherine over the ledge, it wouldn't have solved anything. He actually regrets that he says it. He doesn't think it would have solved anything. And again, this is the major difference between Winston and Julia here. Julia, 
She's just out to have fun. She'd push Catherine over the ledge. Wouldn't even think think twice about it. Winston wants to push her over the ledge. He does not like Catherine, but why divert your energy towards something like that when it's in the end, it's not going to solve nothing? Big Brother's still going to be there. The party's still going to rule. You're still going to be oppressed. You're not going to have the freedoms you have. You're still going to live in the shitty-ass Victory Mansion, drinking your shitty Victory Gin. So, what's the point of it all? You know, again, Catherine believes live fast, die young. She's living secretly, breaking rules, and she want, just wants to keep living in it. She doesn't want anybody to be anybody to bother her, and she doesn't want to start a revolution. Winston does want to start a revolution, but he realizes that they are probably already dead. He's broken so many countless laws, and even though there's no laws in London, but he's broken many rules. He has the diary. He's written in a diary. What else has he done? He's went out to the countryside. He's had sex with a woman. He's has a he has a relationship with this with this woman. Right? He's eaten uh, chocolate, party chocolate. Yeah, like it's all. He's done a lot of shit. Because of that, he thinks that eventually he'll get caught. Julie ends up saying that, hey, we're not caught yet. And as long as I keep being careful, I'm not I'm never gonna get caught. And that's really the difference. And you can kind of tell Winston a little bit older, Catherine younger, maybe a little bit more naive. And there's really like a separation. A, a juxtaposition of these two generations here. Cat, uh, Julia doesn't remember the revolution. She was born after it. Winston was a kid during it. So two different things. Very interesting. That's going to tie into our discussion. This is the end of the slideshow, guys. Uh, our discussion questions explain why the party has made extreme effort to take over the sexual instinct and what do you think is the main difference between how Julia and Winston view the party? We've kind of just been going over that a little bit. If you want to look at my responses to these questions, head over to cheatash, cheatash-tash.ghost.io. Link will be in the, the description of the video. There you can see the responses and blog posts that I have for other chapters and parts of 1984. Thank you guys so much for listening. I really, really appreciate it. We're going to continue on with uh, Chapter 2, Part 4 next time. And I really appreciate it, guys. Thank you so much again. My name is Chris. This has been Ch Chitash. Take care.